Good morning, you the Deans. Guys, really hope that you can all make it today. Um, today, we're going to be looking at chromatography, and we're going to be doing a quick recap on uh, infrared spectroscopy. So it should be a nice, relatively quick one today. Uh, I'm just setting up my other laptop to be able to see whether or not you guys are all in attendance. Just quickly finding that. There you go. At the minute, at the minute you guys aren't there yet, but we will, I will, I will uh, endeavor just to keep going. Uh, so what I'm gonna quickly do, share my screen. There we go. I'm also going to then switch off my camera because I've discovered that if I do that, I get a little bit longer before my screen goes shaky. Right, so you guys should now be able to see my screen. Fab. Right, okay, okay. So, today's lesson, A2 notes. Oh, I don't really want it to be up there. I want it to be down here. There we go, that'll do, I'll pick it up here. Okay, so today we're gonna to be covering, hey Maxine, thanks for coming, great to see you. Today we're gonna to be doing, oh wow, let's try that again. We're gonna be doing infrared, infrared spec, spectroscopy, spectroscopy, brackets IR, that's revision from AS in reality. And then I'm also gonna be doing chromatography. I'm doing that properly. Okay. Okay, so first thing I wanna do is I wanna just, uh, hey Megan, great to see you, thanks for coming. It's great to see you guys. I'm just gonna fiddle around with my laptop, see if I can just reduce it just a little bit, or like then it'll just delay me, uh, delay the screen going all funny. So I'm gonna do learning objectives. I want to just recap, uh, I'm gonna be able to do knowledge, recap IR from AS, brackets AS chem. Reminder uh, to be looking at the data sheet that you guys are gonna be given. Um, then I'm gonna be doing understand chromatography, chromatography as a separation technique as a separation technique. It can be separation stroke identification. Identifi identification. Okay, I'll add in further bullet points to these as we go through. Okay, so first of all, what I quickly wanna do is infrared IR. So the key things that you guys need to know with this, and let's just do some bullet point facts. Okay, so fact number one is what it's used for. And this is used, I'll, I'll actually write, I'll do the notes. Uh, hey Josh, thanks for coming. Used to identify, to identify bonds. And that's really important. This isn't, this isn't really used to identify groups. It can be. And there are specific absorbances that you guys need to be able to recognize. So I'm going to add in some further bullet points up here. So IR, I need you to understand different bonds have different absorbances. And know, know your absorbances. Absorbances, absorbances. Know your absorbances, brackets, groups. But you have to recognize that you're not allowed to say certain things. Okay, so used to identify bonds, and it's done, this is done through different bonds, you can make the note, different bonds absorb, absorb different frequencies, different frequencies of infrared, of IR. Now, I'm just gonna quickly mention the graphs at this point. So a graph appears. And the rather funny thing is about this graph is that the graph is, this is actually on the y-axis, 
This is actually percentage transmittance. Now that's rather odd that I, I, I can't fit on transmittance. Hey, Jason, thanks for coming. It's percentage trans, not percentage absorbance. So what that means is if you were to put a cuvette into the machine uh, and it was empty, zero absorbance, your graph would read 100% across the top. That there is what the graph would look like if you have no sample. No sample. It just means that, it's rather odd, it means the graph's kind of upside down on it. You're seeing these troughs, not peaks, but troughs in this particular type of um, analysis. Okay, next thing is, so different bonds absorb different frequencies of IR. We realize that the y-axis is percentage transmittance. And at the bottom, we have a rather odd thing, which is it goes from a large number on the left to, the sm to a small number on the right. Now, this is actually wave number, which is really weird. Wave number, um, which is really weird. I don't think that's actually the units of wave number. It's like lambda n or something. It's a bit odd. But it's wave number rather than frequency. But can I just say that frequency and wave number are exactly the same in chemistry. We don't see the difference in them. So I don't want you guys to worry so much. Okay, so the next thing is to mention these wave numbers in terms of sections. So there are sections that you guys need to know about. And this is the this is the major one which we need to mention. 400 to 1500 wave numbers. And this region here, this region, pause the video. You can that, that way you can have a going and see if you can remember what this particular region is called. And then you can unpause it. It's called the fingerprint region. Now the fingerprint region is is named literally. It's describing what it's used for. Uh, and so let's just put a couple of bullet point facts about this. Number one, 400 to 1500 wave numbers. Wave number. Next, it is also all, um, all substances, all substances have a different, have a different fingerprint region. I'm just going to shortcut fingerprint region to F fingerprint nice. Fingerprint region, FPR. All substances have a different fingerprint region. Now, how do we use this? Now, the question that often follows this is explain how IR can be used, can be used to identify identify and usually at this point you to identify compounds now most of the time they put you in a context they usually say two isomers distinguish between two isomers yeah and i'll put two isomers so the example the example might be butane Butane versus methylpropane, for example. We know that these two are going to be very difficult to be able to distinguish. They will have a difference, and the difference is this is going to be, this is going to have a slightly lower melting point. It's going to, this is going to have an MPT which is greater than this one's MPT. But we don't need to talk about melting point for these guys. It would be BPT, boiling point. It has a greater boiling point than this guy. We recognize that. When you have a branch isomer, it's nice to add that on. Um, branch isomers, you reduce reduce BPT by about five degrees. So butane has a boiling point of a BPT of zero degrees Celsius. That's actually the boiling one of the ones I actually know. Zero degrees Celsius. Whereas this one is going to be about minus five degrees Celsius BPT. So Nice to done. We could we could attempt 
Uh, wait, what's happening? <laughs> hey, Naomi. Uh, we're just running through infrared, that's all. Just watch the video back from the start and it's absolutely fine. So, some people might argue that you could, some people could argue that you could use boiling point as a, as a way of identifying. This would not be reasonable. The, 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 they're too similar. The, um, they're too similar. Ah, simple. Oh, too similar. Too similar to be able to actually... Is it similar? Too similar? No. Too similar. Too similar uh, to be able to use that. Uh, to be able to identify. So what you would do, and here's the answer to your quest to the question. So how could you use infrared to be able to identify? So you would um, scan sample, scan sample using IR. Uh, questions appearing? No. Uh, sorry folks, just checking questions on other classes. So scan sample using IR spectrometer, spectrometer. And then we're going to say, um, compare, compare fingerprint region, compare fingerprint region to known database known database of compounds find a match find match that's how we do it now there is a limitation to this as well which is if you have an impure sample so if you have this is just a note of bene um, if impurities if impurities are present then you will get, uh, if impurities are present, you will get what's called a percentage match. Yeah, if impurities are present, uh, present uh, match, not exact. Not exact. Not exact, but can still be used. Can still be used. It'll still be used, of course, because you'll get this percentage, but can still be used due to percentage match. What you'll get is between the two, you'll get zero percentage match or, or a low percentage, like 10%, and the other one will be like 85% match. So you can still use it. The fingerprint region is super handy for that particular function. Really, really handy. Okay. So... Next, so now that we've covered fingerprint region, now what I want to do is I want to look at some common absorbances. So can we do common bonds? Common bonds slash absorbances. So at this point, I'm just going to draw a whole load of images. So first thing is you're going to get a peak, a broad peak there like that. At that point, I don't need a line that long. This here is the OH bond alcohol. OH bond alcohol. And you have to state alcohol. It's a broad peak at about 3,000 to 3,300. It's a really handy peak to recognize that because it screams alcohols. And you just have to be able to recognize it. The next one, same region. Same region, but... Now it becomes all distorted and, and broader. That there is the OH acid peak, acid absorbance. It's not a peak, it's a trough. OH acid bond. So that's from a carboxylic acid. Yeah, that's what that simply means. Other ones that you should definitely recognize is a peak. I'm just going to kind of go dot, 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 dot. Is a big spiky peak, a narrow peak. 
there at 1750 wave numbers and that's a seedable bondo now can i just point out there are actual slight variations depending on if that's a ketone or an aldehyde or a carboxylic acid and they can ask you between those and it's on the data sheet don't overthink this when we look at questions it'll make a lot more sense but 1750 really really handy really handy so you'll notice that I did put on another another little peak there. That there is the CH peak. That's the CH trough. Sorry, keep saying peak, shouldn't they? That's the CH trough. Um, but the great thing is those are really the only ones that you really need to know about. You, you could also argue that there's also one slightly lower down than 1700. There's also a smaller peak, dot, 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 just south of that. And this is at 1650. That's 1650, and that's C double bond C. That's a handy one to know as well. Really handy. So these these peaks are just really really useful because you see them. It's such a repetitive thing. They're not trying to make this overly complicated. They're wanting to see whether or not you can actually kind of isolate the bits which are useful when it comes to determining determining structures of compounds. Um, so those are ones to consider. It might be worthwhile as well just throwing in at this point I'm going to talk about some exam questions. That's really all you need for infrared. But the problem is that the questions, the questions from the exams can often be slightly daunting for students because they feel like the topic is so short and so straightforward that they then don't understand why they find the questions tricky. So I'm not going to do it to the side, I don't think. Uh, that doesn't really like it. I'll just do them down here. So in terms of exam questions, there are some nice, interesting ones uh, that you often come across. Um, so the first one is carbon dioxide. Now, carbon dioxide has the C double bond O peak, trough, ah, absorbance. So you would expect to see an enormous peak at 1750 wave numbers for that particular bond. But in reality, you don't. The carbon dioxide is actually shifted, I do dot, 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 and you get a really broad, you get a much, much bigger peak, but now that's shifted to around about 2,200. So that's actually, that's a C double bond O, that's not in its common place. Now this question does commonly get asked today, level. they'll be like, looking at the graph, explain why carbon dioxide's infrared is un unexpected. So the question would be, why, what why unusual unusual i r and you say c double bond o trough in wrong location in wrong location and you could then even put expected expected at seventeen fifty so not particularly complicated just a, an interesting one uh, other ones that have occurred uh, other exam questions that have occurred, um, which is if you look at the IR spectrum, so this is where I'm going to drop to the in internet. If you look at the IR spectrum, uh, Donna, could you quickly grab me the fan from the bedroom? It's plugged in underneath the table where my phone usually is. Um, if we quickly look at the spectrum, um, let's do CO2, CO2 infrared. I R spectrum. And if you're wondering what the noise is, I'm just putting a little fan on my laptop to try and cool it down a bit because it's having a bit of a something a minor freak out. And it'd be good just to cool it down a little bit. There we go. Okay, so if you look at the IR spectrum, uh, and there you go, you can see that these, the C double bond O trough is way higher than it should be, more like 2400 really, rather than 22. Pulling numbers out of my head, more like 24. Yeah. Um, but they can say, explain, explain using the infrared spectrum why it's a greenhouse gas. So explain using, explain using IR data why co2 is a uh, greenhouse gas and of course the answer to that is it's absorbing infrared yeah so the answer is simple 
CO2 is absorbing, absorbing IR infrared radiation from the sun, from sun. And the second bullet point is trapping energy, trapping IR energy in atmosphere, in ATM. So not overly complicated, only two marks. But this is usually then followed up with another question, which is water. So water, if we look at the infrared spectrum of, of H2O, it's very different from that of CO2. Let's do H2O IR spectrum, and look what you notice. The infrared spectrum of water is much, much bigger. It has a huge amount of absorbance. So if we were to compare these two, we've got carbon dioxide, CO2, which looked a little bit like this. You had a couple of peak, a couple of troughs up there, but not many. And then kind of none. And then a big absorbance, which hit the base at about 2,400. And then you had a few little minor peaks over there, but that was kind of it. And this, this area here shows how much infrared is being absorbed and trapped in the atmosphere. So for CO2, it's actually not that much. But if you look at H2O, H2O absorbance is enormous. It's absolutely massive. We've got a huge, huge amount of absorbance at this top end. Huge amount. Uh, and then you get another peak and then a kind of a ride off at the end, I seem to recall. And then it goes up and maybe at the end, there we go, it's got another absorbance bit at the end there. So this bit, you have a peak and then, and then it goes up again like that. So water's absorbance is all of this. It's enormous. It is probably a hundred times greater. So absorbance is greater. Absorbance is far greater for H2O than it is for carbon dioxide. Probably about a hundred times. Now what that means is water is much, much, much worse greenhouse gas. Far, far worse. So why do we not seem to be moaning about it as much as we do with carbon dioxide? Yeah, they're gonna say, what, um, why is H2O not talked about? The reason being is it doesn't remain in the atmosphere. Yeah, water comes down as rain. So the percentage in the air is relatively static. And obviously it fluctuates all the time, a bit like an equilibrium does, but it's still relatively stable. H2O gas, called steam, doesn't remain in atmosphere. It doesn't remain in ATM. So if it doesn't remain in the atmosphere, it's not gonna be tapping heat in the atmosphere. It comes down as rain. Rains. Yeah. Whereas CO2, of course, is staying there. Other gases uh, of interest, of course, is methane. So it'd be interesting to look at methane spectrum. Methane, of course, is just the CH bonds. So let's have a look at what methane looks like. I don't want to write there. There we go. Let's try methane. Methane, oh, I just couldn't get the O off. So you right, so there you go. There's methane. So methane again. Uh, similar to carbon dioxide, probably in its total absorbance, very similar. Um, but of course, it, oh, maybe that one, maybe that one's a better one. Methane infrared tandems. Oh, tribromomethane. That's definitely not what we want. We just want to stick with the methane one. There we go. So, again, similar to CO2, probably in its total. But of course, methane is again staying in the atmosphere. So, much more problematic than carbon dioxide is. Um, what I will do is, you guys, of course, have the booklet now um, for uh, analytical chemistry. And and it's important that you have a look at the infrared questions that I've been asked over the years. It'll just clarify little bits and pieces for you that you might want to just make sure you've got down. That's all. OK, so next. So we kind of looked at IR briefly and I don't want to spend too long doing it. I'd much prefer to move on to the chromatography um, because you guys haven't done any of this before. 
So it's definitely worthwhile me going into that and we can come back to this when you guys have got some questions. I might even do my next webinar. I'll do some questions on IR and chromatography specifically. I'll look at the exam questions and the techniques. So the next one is chromatography. Now, chromatography, of course, at GCSE, all you ever talk about is paper. Now, of course, paper chromatography is is obviously rubbish. Um, it, it doesn't allow you to separate. You won't end up with different things. You know, it's an analytical process rather than a separation technique. <laughs> <coughs> but paper, paper chromatography, which you learn in GCSE, is sometimes, well, it's, its actual name is called thin layer. Thin layer chrome, TLC, thin layer chromatography. Now, what thin layer is, now there's, of course, I'll talk about the two versions of this, which is version one, which is GCSE, which is your key stage three paper chromatography. What you've got is you've got your piece of paper, you put it in your solvent, yeah, you draw your pencil line on, yeah, you add your chemicals, yeah, and then they move up and you produce these spots on the paper and you can then compare them, let's call this substance A and let's call this substance B. And what you can do is you can compare them. This is called a chromatogram. Now, what you don't get, what you don't get in reality uh, from the GCSE is a bit more of the detail and the process. So the piece of paper, this is actually called the stationary phase. This is called the stationary phase. The solvent, the solvent, by the way, and the solvent, I'll put solvent here, solvent, which is usually H2O, but it does depend. You know, if you're using something that's non-polar, then you're going to want to use something like acetone, that's always a good one, or propanone. Uh, you might even want to use ethanol. These are all common, common solvents. Um, okay, so these are my different solvents. Now these, these are called the mobile phase. This is called the mobile phase. Now, the question that no student ever asks is, why do the different dyes reach different heights? Now, of course, at GCSE, all you're asked to do with these, all you're asked to do with them is you're expected to be able to pull them out and calculate what's called an RF value. Now that stands for, um, the original words were actually retardation factor, awfully. And then that now has changed to retention, uh, retention factor, retention factor value. Uh, and what you do is, you realize that the solvent goes up a certain way. We know that the solvent travels up the paper and then so does the dye. And we do what's called dot front, dot front over solvent front. And all of these are in millimeters, by the way. Dot front over solvent front, all of them in millimeters. Um. I'm just trying to find out if you guys have asked any questions yet. Um, dot front or the solvent front. Um, so this would be something like the dot would have moved 55 millimeters. And by the way, you need a ruler which works, folks. It's amazing how many students take in a ruler that doesn't actually give them the correct value. Let's say the solvent moves 75 millimeters. And you're always going to have what's called an RF value. The RF value is going to start with 0 point something, 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 two decimal places. Yeah, it's not overly complicated, but the question is, question, question is, why, why do some, why do some travel further than others? Further than others. Now, I don't know whether or not you guys have talked about this, or maybe you've got an idea about it. So if you want to, you're more than welcome now just to pause the video and have a go at writing down some of these diff some of these points. It's a three mark question at A level. So pause it if you want to have a go, write down those bullet points, otherwise then you can just listen. So point number one is 
different substances different substances have different affinities and there's a key word have different I'm going to capitalize that if you like affinities affinities for the solvent for it no for the stationary for the stationary and mobile phase mobile phase so the marks affinities for the stationary and mobile phase um, um, substances stop substances stop moving substances stop moving when uh, affinities affinities for stationary and mobile are equal so that's actually what's happening they're reaching the point of equilibrium where they'd much they, they have the same affinity for the stationary as they do for the mobile now this actually makes total sense because you guys have been answering a question for years about why is the line why is the line in pencil now the reason being is you learned the so line in pencil question mark and of course the answer is that graphite is insoluble graphite insoluble what that means is in reality we can now translate it to a level graphite has a higher affinity for the stationary phase than this mobile phase so therefore it doesn't move it's much much prefers to be on the paper than to be in the water not complicated okay <clears throat> so different solvents by the way will give you all different rf values and again how could you use an rf value second question question um how can we use rf value answer compare on a database compare value on known database it's on a database of known you have to put in by the way it's actually quite a fun game to do this how do you measure the affinity for stationary and mobile phase uh, maxine you don't need to the affinities have already been done for you the affinities are measured uh, it, it's just a ratio between the two great question the answer is it's very difficult to measure it, but you don't need to measure it. There's no singular value here. Um, there's no singular value that you need. It's just this idea of comparing the ratio to give you an RF value. Now, just so you just so you know, the extra detail here is how could you compare these on a database? um if we've got different solvents well the, the website's going to ask you that when you when you go to the values which are owned but mostly by japanese companies is you go onto their website and it will say it will say in this box <laughs> it will say salt it'll just say mobile phase stationary phase yeah mobile phase stationary phase you have to give the names and then what you do is you put in your RF value and what it will then so you put in all three of these things in 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 and then what it will do is it will compare it and give you a match again a percentage match most of the time they're usually pretty good actually it's actually better than I are in reality uh, what do you mean by affinity uh, the word affinity how much it likes it affinity is um it's how much it likes to be in the water how much or in the in the mobile how much it likes to be on the paper it means how much it likes to affinity desire to be in yeah desire to be in the desire to be in the station or desire to be in the mobile good question joss thanks for asking and then what will yeah this all this on the website will spit you out a percentage match and then it'll give you your percentage of 98 percent match 
and it'll say identity and it then just spits it out for you which is nice yeah and then it'll just spit out an identity so, like electron affinity like that no 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 Jackson. electron affinity is the the heat energy change when one mole of electron is gained by one mole of gaseous uh, gaseous atoms forming one mole of uni negative ions all all under standard conditions that electron affinity is the heat is the enthalpy change when something gains an electron Jackson be careful totally different words totally different okay so now that we've properly talked about paper what we now need to do is start putting this into the more a-level context so at a-level what do we now realize that we're doing so thin layer tlc thin layer chromatography is now a bit more special because you haven't got a piece of paper anymore you 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 have got you have a glass a glass sheet coated coated most commonly is that looks like something else it looks like coated or something a glass sheet coated in aluminium oxide that is the most common stationary phase that there is for tlc but this is the stat phase uh, if people are wondering what the glass sheet is about the glass sheet is just a substrate it's just it's just something to hold it that is all Sorry, I'm just applying to which uh, I'm going to be a second to pass on Google Hangouts for one second. Sorry, there we go. Definitely going to close down Google Hangouts for sure. Okay, so yeah, so the glass sheet is just a substrate. So it needs to be glass because the aluminium oxide is a white powder. And that white powder you can't have as a, a stationary phase, like a piece of paper without having something to attach it to. And it's glued to glass because glass is inert. Yeah, it's just, it's called sometimes called a substrate, just for something to be holding a glass sheet coated in, and that's the stationary phase, right? Once again, exactly the same process. You're going to draw a pencil line. Uh, now, just to point out that sometimes they say the word etch, etch, pencil line. You've got to be careful here because it's quite a soft surface and if you dig too hard you'll go in too deep and you'll damage it so you're going to well i don't like the word etch pencil line put on lightly put on lightly so not to damage so not to damage surface coating And same thing again, exactly the same. Yeah, we're going to be using it. We're going to see the dots that move up. By the way, you get more like smudges rather than dots in reality. Yeah. Sometimes, by the way, the the dots can be invisible. So a lot of the time, <clears throat> question, um, not all substances not all substances uh, can be seen mm, not all substances can be seen um after separation after tlc run run so the question would be how could you make them visible how could you make visible uh, this is more of a biology trick than a chemistry one although this is definitely in a chemistry setting uh, i'm pretty sure you guys are going to know the answer to this yeah one mark pause it if you want to have a go and the answer of course is you're going to add a dye a um add dye add dye after after process has been run you can't be run you can't add a dye first 
The reason why you can't add it first, folks, is because if you add it first, the dye binds to your substance, which means it's going to change the affinity for the stationary and the mobile. So you have to add the dye after the process is finished. And then it's often, by the way, another answer is sometimes UV light. UV light is also a common one. Uh, add dye, use UV light to make visible. Take a photograph. It's not complicated. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I think most of you will already realize that TLC has a very specific function. And that's to identify, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to increase my pen thickness. Let's increase my pen thickness. This is done to identify. It's not really done to separate because all that's going to happen is it's going to run off the page and you won't really be able to collect them. So what that meant was they then took TLC and they evolved it. So they evolved it into column. So you can put a quick subtitle of column chromatography. So column chromatography is very similar in nature to TLC. However, we're now using a, what looks like a burette. So the column, the column is, is literally a tube. So the, this, is, this is called the column. And this tube, this tube is packed with commonly used words include stationary phase, yeah, and it's usually white, by the way. I'll use gray in this case. They pack the column with all kinds of cool stuff. And this is your stationary phase. They can indeed, they can indeed use aluminium oxide, common, packed with. You okay, Angel? Uh, packed with aluminium oxide, for example, uh, or commonly said resin. Now, resin, oh, can you add fluorescence sometimes? Absolutely. Of course you can. That'll be the UV-based one, my only. Yeah, but again, you must add the dye. Whatever colouring, whatever marker you use, you must add after the process has finished. You can't add it beforehand, because if you add it beforehand, you're going to cause issues. Um, uh, try and I'm trying to cool my laptop down as it's really really hot. So it's packed with aluminium oxide, or sometimes deemed resin. Now resin is just another another packing agent. Yeah, they probably won't even tell you what packing agent is going to be. Um, this, of course, is our stationary phase. So we can put stack phase. Now column chromatography. Is much is is has a very different function to TLC because this is a true method. This is a true method of separation. A true method for separation. What we're going to be able to do is we are now going to add our mixture in. Let's create a mixture. So we're going to create a mixture. Here's my mixture. Oh, I'm going to make that really nice and thick, just to make it easier for me to draw. So here's my mixture, and this is my mixture. I'm going to go even thicker than that, make it even easier for myself. Yeah, this, this mixture, which is green, I'm going to call A, and we're going to add, and this mixture contains, let's describe what this has in it. A contains X, Y, and Z. I'll give you a real context in a minute, an exam context. And what we're going to do is we're going to put A inside the column. Now, when A goes into the column, it soaks in to whatever substrate is there. So it'll soak in and it will stop. It'll stop moving. This is exactly the same as, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not like, um, it, it, it's a bit like paper in terms of the dots go on and they don't move. What we now need to do is we now need to get them to move. And in TLC, the solvent moves up the paper. Yeah, over here, in order to get the dots to move up, what we do is we add 
our solvent, by the way, I'm suddenly realizing there's detail, detail here I've missed, which is when you do this, you can add this, please do. Yeah. You have to have a lid on it. This is done in a beaker and it has a lid. The lid is to prevent, prevent the solvent evaporating. That's what it's there, there to do. And what happens is the solvent moves up the page and it drags the dyes with it. Well, we need to do the same thing here, but with the column. What we're going to do, we added A first. And then what we're going to do is we're going to flush it through. And we're going to flush it through using a solvent. So we're now on top of this, we're going to add our solvent. And that, of course, is our mobile phase. And th this could be any of the same solvents we had previously. Yeah, it could have been water, could have been chloromethane. It could have been all kinds of things. But we're going to wash it through with solvent. And what happens is the solvent, we keep adding it, we keep flushing it, we keep putting it in over and over and over and over. And what will happen is the, the mixture will separate as it moves down. So I need to try and make these a bit darker. So let's call this one. The purple one was, what did I put in there? X, Y, and Z. The purple one is X. Then the change my color. Then the green one, the dark green one is going to be Y, and then the dark blue is going to be Z. So what you can see is, as the solvent pushes them through, as the solvent is moving down. It separates out the substances. And what you realize is that some move faster than others. So what we now say is they have different retention times. So this is nota bene. Different substances, different substances have different retention have different i'm going to capitalize it retention times now this is kind of cool this because retention times they're going to pop out in order the first one that's going to pop out is going to be blue yeah z's going to come out first out comes z and i get to collect it yeah this is otherwise known as an eluent, I believe. I'm going to use that word in a while. They have different retention times. So Z has the lowest retention time. And would you agree now, this is once again, it's to do with the affinity this time for the stationary, not the solvent. In this case, it's saying that Z does not like to be with the stationary phase. Yeah. It is to do with the balance again. The balance will give their time. Yeah. Balance between, balance between affinity, affinity of stat stationary phase and mobile phase decides retention time, decides, decides retention time. And you can actually separate them. You can actually collect the liquids as they appear, as they come out through this. And that's really handy. It's a true method of separation rather than, I've suddenly realized I have zoomed right out in this lesson, which is good, I think. So, okay. So you'll then just collect them as they go through. So the next thing is, how is this going to appear to you in context of exam questions? So in reality, what they're going to do, they're going to say something like, so exam style question, exam question. They're going to give you something like this methanol, methanol 
methane diol, methane diol, and chloromethane. Let's actually put it in as trichloro to make it a liquid. That's chloroform, trichloromethane. So the question now is, they're going to say to you, who has the greatest retention time? Who, who has the greatest retention time? And explain retention time and why. So don't overthink it. It's all to do with intermolecular forces. We realize that the one that's going to have the least, the least affinity for the stationary phase is this guy. That's only DDs, only dipole-dipole attractions. That's going to move through the column quickly. However, this one has got two OH groups, so it will form two hydrogen bonds per molecule. Two H bonds per molecule, whereas this one only has one HB per molecule. So the one that's going to have the longest is going to be di um, methane diol. That will have the highest because it has two hydrogen bonds per molecule, therefore the highest affinity for the stationary phase. Answer. Um, forms two, oh sorry, answer, who has the greatest? Methane diol. Let's state that straight off the bat. Methane diol. Why two H hydrogen bonds per molecule? Per molecule, oh. Uh, the least soluble. Oh, right. Now, Justin, I can't totally get that. You have to choose a solvent. Uh, in this case, we're going to be separating them with something like acetone. We're going to be using something that's polar. But we're actually looking at the, the affinity for the stationary rather than the affinity for the mobile. Go figure. This is the one that we kind of tend to just focus on. Um, highest affinity. Highest affinity. Or stationary stationary phase that's just a general rule we tend to focus on the stationary we call them rather than the solvent okay the next the next exam question is a bit harder so the next one I give you was this so they give you methanamine methanamine they give you Um, oh, two hydroxide, two hydroxy. Oh, no. Amino methanol for that one. <laughs> and they give you this one. This one's far harder. Far harder. Diamino methane. Methane diamine. And then, of course, uh, they'll do something like this one. Now, this one's much more clever. It's much cleverer than amino acid. The reason why this is clever is because they both, all three, in fact, all three of them form two hydrogen bonds. All three form two hydrogen bonds per molecule. So would everyone agree that they are going to be very similar? Oh, oh, no. Oh, and folks, they're all three. I've had to close my my chat down. By the way, I do apologise. See if I can bring it back up. Uh, my my laptop's being insane. Um, right. So, w would everyone agree? There's a problem here. Uh, hang on. Why does it have to have a great affinity for stationary phase? If the stationary phase is not better than the case, will it usually be given? Yes. Josh, it will usually be given to you, but even if they don't give it to you, we tend to refer it to the intermolecular forces and the stationary phase, and we assume that if they've got internet, stronger intermolecular forces, they'll have chosen a resin or a stationary phase that'll match, that will form those bonds. So yes, in aluminium oxide is the case in this, in this regard. So would everyone agree there's a problem here? All three form two hydrogen bonds, which means their original retention time Retention, retention times similar. We couldn't use it. 
similar. That's similar. I'm an idiot. Uh, similar. So, but there's a really sneaky trick with this, folks. Really sneaky. We will put these. Uh, I'm going to do this in a different color. Put in acidic conditions. Put in acidic conditions. We're going to put these into acids. Now, the reason why this is handy is because if you put this into acids, here's what's going to happen. You're going to protonate the amine groups. And look what now happens. Right. Guys, A, B, and C, which one now has the greatest retention time? Pause the video, have a go, and explain your answer. And the answer, of course, question, which has greatest rest, greatest retention time? I'm really struggling today. Retention time? The answer being B. B does. The reason being is, and the explanation as to why, B has formed, has formed a plus two cation. Yeah, which means greater retention, greater affinity affinity for stationary phase higher retention time greater retention time ren time i'll put i'll put rest time right guys that brings us to the end of the lesson today be at its most soluble no jacket not saying solubility it's not they'd all be soluble they all would be. They're all positive. They're all going to dissolve in the water. They all form hydrogen bonds. Or whatever it's called and used. It's the affinity for the stationary phase gap that we've got to focus on. Right. What am I going to do? That brings me to the end of my lesson. I'm going to see if I can bring back my camera. My laptop is having a total meltdown. Total meltdown. Um, and I'm going to go back to my stream yard. Go back to start cam, seeing if that actually brings that back up again. The stream. And get rid of that one. Right, guys. Okay. So I hope that was useful. I will pick this up. We have done TLC and we have done column. Um, I am just going to cover some of the other ones as well. Things like gas liquid chromatography, GL. Yeah, I'm also going to do HPLC, high performance liquid chromatography as well. Um, why does more positive mean greater affinity? Higher charge, Naomi, whichever, if you've got a higher positive charge, you're going to have a much higher attraction to any negative ions, which means it's going to slow your movement down. Um, I hope this has been handy. I will post, uh, have a look at the booklets I've given you. All the questions are there. Guys, state, are we done? We are live today, Jackson, yes. Guys, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care of yourselves. Stay safe. It's nice to see you guys and be doing the questions. I'll see you all soon. It's good to see you guys. Uh, is aluminium oxide Uh It's ionic with covalent character. There you go. <laughs> uh, I'll see you soon, guys.